Hi, everyone, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Map Round Show. This is the Secrets of Fail series where we're talking to successful CEOs and entrepreneurs all about their epic business blunders. You know, the stuff they won't share on their LinkedIn timeline. That's what you're going to get here on this particular episode uh, of the Map Round Show. And with us in the hot seat today, all the way from New York, is the CEO of Advantages, Fran Biderman Gross. Fran, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Perfect. So why don't you kick us off with the uh, elevator pitch, uh, Fran? Tell us a little bit adva- about Advantages and uh, what you guys are up to over there. So we were founded. No, I'm just kidding. Um, listen, nobody really nobody really wants to hear the long version. But in a nutshell, we ensure companies get return on investment for their marketing spend. We drive profit with purpose through marketing performance. Um, that is not just digital marketing, but is it is strategic marketing that align with your business objectives and ignores all of the vanity and all the things that, oh, you know, everybody else does. We actually do stuff for generating results to protect your money. Perfect. Sounds great. Drive your profit with purpose through marketing performance. That sounds like an incredible elevator pitch. Who are you typically working uh, with? I mean, who is your customer typically? Absolutely. We thrive uh, with really working with, I'm going to say, purpose-driven leaders, really, that are the CEOs of their company that have very clear objectives, because we know that the most successful companies have clear communication. So when we think about the positive, um, I'm going to say the duality of the positive, the positivity that comes from that internally and externally, the agency really handles the, the strategic side of external, but there's double, complete double benefit to the, uh, to the internal team driving, I'm going to say, impact to leadership, culture, and playback, along with marketing, internal, external, you know, yep. tactical, so you, digital, all So that. you look 360 at the business. So it's internal and external, right? Yep. All righty. So that's that's pretty different. Every, most other agencies, quote unquote, are like, let's just do the external. So that's, I suppose, that's what makes you different, right? I think is one thing. I think the other thing that makes us different is just our our dedication, our diehard dedication to strategic approach. I don't let the CEO or the leadership team or the C-suite wrestle me down to, we need a website. And I'm like, maybe, but you're not the expert to determine the marketing activities. So we let the objective dictate the marketing objectives or the marketing job to be done, as we like to say it. Um, and then we'll, of course, deploy, you know, tactic after tactic. But I'm going to say that in the world today, agencies are very specialist driven. We are anti-specialist because we're good at so many things, but we're really a strategic generalist hmm. that brings really subject matter expertise. And I'm going to say that really, we're really notably recognized for many different skill sets and capacities, but the number one metric is return on investment for that marketing spend. So there you go. Yeah. But, but that's a conversation we need to have on your podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, let's get into the meat and the potatoes of this particular episode. Uh, Fran, what is your story of fail for our audience around the world today? So I'm going to tell you, I had to figure out which one because I felt like this, this entire podcast series was kind of meant for me. I probably could have three or four episodes on it with the amount of times we fail. And we all know that we, that we truly learn much more from failure than we do for success because when we're, when we're succeeding, whatever that means to us, we just take our eye off so many of the balls. But when we're really crunched and really stretched and really pushed down to the ground, I, I like to say that I have more lives than a cat. I've seen more dirt over my face that I've been able to resurrect from. Um, but the story I want to really focus on today is one that was really I- incredibly trying and watching, you know, 2008 come in and swoop a very large portion of our business, you know, practically overnight. It's almost a mimic story from 9-11. Um, I feel like I've lived through it twice. So COVID three times a charm, buddy. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So basically, it was uh, 2008. How much of your book did you lose? Uh, about 60%, just virtually. Yeah, you know, recession has a has an opportunity to do that. And before we were this strategic generalist in this position with our narrative, 
we were we were doing just a big book of business on the print side and really printing deliverables like in the form of award books and journals and things like that and the world changed overnight when that when everybody's budget had to get tight and everybody had to get creative and while the events needed to go on and the fundraising needed to happen they decided that the books shrunk so the books were no longer books they were no longer award books they were actually like scrolls or you almost uh, listings. So, you know, you took a two, three, 400 page book that you would churn and burn into the wee hours of the night, just days before. And we, in our heyday, we were doing about 55, 60 of them a year. And literally overnight, everybody said, okay, we're going to have the dinner. We're going to scale back, you know, the filet mignon and we'll go back to chicken. But the one thing we're going to cut is the journal. I'm like, but that's, that's where you get all your, it's where you're fundraising. Oh, but we're going to do it a different way. So we had to really react quickly to how we could pivot to an online journal where we could cut the costs in half versus watching them go completely away. So it was a very big shock. There were a lot of existing contracts that just turned around and, you know, really obliterated. Mm. And uh, we're very agile and very, very resourceful and very creative. And re- recognizing that our job was to be in alignment with what we are today, which is creating return on investment. We had to create a different experience, albeit it took a while to climb up the revenue ladder um, again, but we didn't lose clients per se. We modified the experience and really had to come up from that. So, mm. you know, we really did lose the business. It didn't take very long to pivot in that way. Um, and really rebuild from there. And I can honestly tell you, it never rebounded. So it was a, it was a true uh, loss and change. And, you know, it was, it was a failure of systems that we needed to really work through. Yeah, epic. So Fran, uh, when you think back about that experience, what did, what is the kind of key insight or lesson that you took forward with you into advantages as it is today? So one of the key things, uh, just to premise that question, is that your breakdowns in, in entrepreneurship are oftentimes your breakthrough. So doing print and now it's like, oh, snap, we actually need to pivot and go online. And so now you're online. And so I'm curious to get your view. Like, what did, you, what did that experience teach you? Well, I think a few things. First of all, you know, if there isn't a lesson in, you know, positivity, positive leadership and optimism that has to ring through no matter what you're faced with, because we as leaders set the stage for the the entire team's disposition. So regardless of what we were faced with from a sales perspective, we had to figure out a way to just not that it we we had the responsibility to be honest but to really delicately balance that we weren't going to like implode or fail. So that was, that's been a consistent learning. I think I've, part of me thinks I've mastered that for the most part. Although if you ask my team, they'll tell you I'm a total liar. Like I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm honest to a fault. Um, But I do protect, I do protect the team from, you know, I, I don't know. I th- I'm going to say here's the biggest lesson, and I didn't really learn it till I'm going to say the, the latter part of last year. That worry has no room in the English language, right? Like you almost lose this alternate. You be when you start to worry about things, you go into an alternate state of reality, and you start painting outcomes, and you just you're just you you work yourself up into a tizzy. And I learned in 2008 specifically never to do that. Um, I didn't really understand that until now. And I could really give you that, you know, I could articulate it, but it's eliminating worry because we're going to deal with things head on in an agile way, no matter what. And that, that second lesson of, you know, diehard optimism, it just can't die. You, you know, there's always going to be another thing when, you know, when one door closes, one door opens, that's always true. Um, you just have to look a little harder. And sometimes you got to kick that door and you got to kick that door until it cracks, until it's open. Yeah, I was like, to me, those are the two biggest lessons from a leadership perspective. Um, You know, and then again, rolling with agility and being able to be innovative in a way, maybe it's not true innovation, right? 
sticking on, you know, a phone on a, you know, a camera on a phone is not true innovation. But I think, you know, creating an experience that is different feels innovative. Um, and in an agile way, if we can, if we can do it and do it well and still achieve the return on investment and achieve the memorable positivity, driving value to the client, then mm. I don't know. I think we consistently learn those 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 hard lessons often. Mm. Yeah, such great stuff there, friend. I mean, I think the I heard once that the the word worry in Latin literally means by definition to choke. Yeah. So if you worry, you're literally choking off your kind of life force, right? And I yeah. think as a, as a fellow entrepreneur, a lot of what you say I resonate with. You know, it's about just finding a way, zigging and zagging, um, and not worrying about the outcomes, just worrying about your inputs, like the things that you can control. And then just writing it out, you know, and saying, cool, yeah. well, I'm just going to sit here and suffer every single day until we get to where we need to get to, right? And, and, and that's the definition of entrepreneurship. It's, it's this um, journey of uncertainty. And, and what I've learned, I don't know if you agree with me or not on this one, but the only certainty in entrepreneurship is uncertainty. Like you, you will only ever get that. How, how could I not agree with that? I, know, um, right. I think it's more fun and entertaining if I did disagree with yeah, it. But I, <laughs> I think the way that I frame that is that um, I really learn, learn to accept the things I cannot change or control. Mm -hmm. So like you said, I can only control my inputs, whether it's my emotion, whether it's my ability to, you know, solve a problem and how, you know, we can do that in a collaborative way, keeping true to the mission keeping true to the objective. It's just, you know, I don't know. I'll give you my line, right? Focused or be fuckist. It's really just, it's really just, that's just it, you know? Um, <laughs> and I try to remain focused on the things that I need to focus on and only really get involved with the things that I can control um, and accept the things that I can't. And just, you know, what do they say? Over the fence, under the fence, fuck the fence, yeah. blow up the fence, that. Yeah. So that's very much... You know, my, I don't know, I come from all that stock for sure. For sure. So, friend, let's go back in time. If I gave you the keys to the Matt Brown Show time machine and you had the luxury and privilege of doing things differently, uh, let's go back to 2008. You know, would you do anything differently? And if you would, you know, why? You know, it's really funny. I try really hard not to dwell on that. And the lesson, and the reason why is I learned a very important lesson uh, probably seven years prior to that, which is when you're faced with a very difficult decision. And I was, I mean, I lost my husband in 2001. I was 33. Um, he was my partner, not only in life and, you know, my husband, but I couldn't, I couldn't control anything having to do with that. And I really needed to pick up the pieces of the business that he was really good at and find a way to either master it or delegate it. And I, in true entrepreneurial spirit, had to figure out a way to master it before I could even delegate it because I didn't understand it. And I'm very much a learner and I need to understand all facets before I can expect someone to have a good outcome. But when I think about and I almost got, I knew that it was going to get me off track. But when I think, and if I'm off track even more, please re bring me back. But when I think about, um, no, I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, we were doing uh, the time machine. What, what would you do yeah. differently? Yeah. What would I change? What would you change? I, I, I would tell my younger self, right, that it's okay to make mistakes, but to always just learn from them because they're all, you know, all too often we beat ourselves up from the from the things that we absolutely wish we would have done differently. But I've also learned, which is how I got off track, um, that you know you, you have as leaders or as CEOs, we have to make good decisions quickly with the information that we have. Mm. And we just have to make sure that the information we're being given is good. Because if it's not, that's what we have to change. But we can't continuously beat ourselves up for the decisions we make. We have to accept the decision we make and then and just keep forging forward. So I think if I learned that lesson a little bit earlier, I probably would be less black and blue underneath self-induced 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's hard to change. I, I, it's interesting. It's a bit of an, a weird question. That was well, a great question. If the, I think the answer is, would you change it though? Because like, if you changed it, then you wouldn't be where you are. You wouldn't have become who you became. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, sure. And, I mean, listen. I yeah. wish there. You know, I wish I didn't lose my husband. I wish I didn't go through. You know, 2008. I wish I didn't you know, get involved in a project and make millions of dollars for other people. And then they're like, sue me, it's cheaper. You know, like, I wish I wouldn't have done some of those things. But on the other hand, because I did those, because I lived through those things, it really has contributed to who I am today, the type of leader I have become, um, the type of mother, the type of wife, the type of, you know, self-serving citizen in my own community. So I, I'm pretty... I'm pretty happy and confident that I'm that I do the right that I do my best to do the right thing when I'm faced with things and I think that I wasn't always I don't know my grandmother used to tell me you know one day I hope you love and embrace the people that love you love them fiercely and the people that they that don't fuck them mm. and it, like I didn't I was like what I want everybody to like me so I I think if I I wish I didn't care what other people thought a little bit younger it would probably be better for my own mental health. Um, but that's a lesson I think that, you know, that I really try to impart not only, you know, to my team, but to my, to everyone, to my kids, mm. to my friends, because it's really not about what everybody else thinks. No, not at all. If but I would have had that when I was younger. Yeah. I would have had a little bit more confidence when I was younger. I agree with you. I'm the same, but you know, you have to, it's the QBE, you know, it's qualified by experience. You only work, you know, wind up with these insights and these lessons through experience, right? They don't grow on trees. They're not lying in any book necessarily. You actually have to go through these things yourself. Uh, Fran quickly, um, what is your advice now today, knowing what you've now known and experienced, um, about the importance of failure in becoming successful as a CEO? You can't be successful till you fail. You really cannot. You don't understand what success can really look like until you've fallen and truly fail. And I can honestly, with great um, vulnerability, tell you I have failed a number of a number of times, more times than I'd like to count. But like I said, I've got nine lives. I've got a couple left. Yep, awesome for sure. stuff. Fran, are there books, tools, or resources that you recommend other entrepreneurs, CEOs use on uh, their journey? So it's like on what topic? So I can tell you that a couple of my favorite books, um, I'm going to say my current favorite books are, of course, Start With Why. I mean, when you really understanding the communications of theory, it's very finest when you really can put that to good use. That would be great. Um, I think about... Um, Oh my gosh. You know, Vivid Vision and Meeting Suck. I love Cameron. I think that he really is able to frame and discuss things in a way that's really very helpful. Um, another book, The Go-Giver, right? There's just, there's a couple of things just so that, you know, you yourself as a leader, if you can just really take into consideration and in, into account, it'll you'll just be better for it. Um, the GPS to self empowerment. It's a really small, very difficult read by Faye Mandel. She was just one of the most unbelievable communications coaches I've ever had. Um, I mean, those are just just a few. Sounds like uh, a great list. All of those I haven't read. <laughs> In fact, sorry, that's not true. Vivid Vision I have read. Yeah, yeah, it's a great. And then book. you know, I wouldn't mind throwing mine in there because. Once you understand what to do with why, then that's really just the playbook on what, you know, how you can achieve return on investment in every aspect of your business. So what's your book called? It's a true adventure. <clears throat> oh, um, the name of the book, you know, is a very long, annoying title. Thank you, Wiley. Um, how, how to, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> how, to, how to lead a values-based professional services firm. Because I always start with the subtitle, which is really, should yeah, have yeah. been the book. It wasn't the book, which is the three keys on how to drive profit with purpose. Okay. And that's a choose your own adventure because, you know, read the intro. It's an easy read. Great story. Um, chapters one, two, and three about culture and leadership. And then just dive into the approach mm -hmm. and then read whatever chapter you like. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds good. Well, look, uh, Fran, I'll be checking out your book and some of those other recommendations for sure. But that does conclude your time in the hot seat. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing uh, your epic business blender with uh, my audience. Appreciate you for that. My pleasure. I always love the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, me too. I got to be on the other side more often. That's what I say. <laughs> well, I look, appreciate you for being here, Fran, and wishing you and the rest of the Advantages team all the best. Well, thank you so much. You have an inside track on that. I know, right? I do, but we went to don't say anything. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all, all again right. soon. Ciao, ciao. Bye.